freezing on open. I think we are. So I think Welcome I to I Read Resistance Radio, where we discuss the resistance work going on in Minnesota's 2nd Congressional District. IREB is an indivisible group formed after the 2016 election in opposition to uh, an executive that we feared was going to do grave damage to our country. All as, as our fears have been proven out, so has our membership grown. We attract people from across the political spectrum, but make no mistake, we are united as progressive force in Minnesota's politics. Join us on our Facebook page, search for The Indivisible Resistance of Egan and Burnsville. And this is one of our initial podcasts today. We are meeting with uh, 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 Bill Halter from the uh, Richard Painter campaign. And with us today, we have Sarah Chapman and Cheryl Casey, both also members of IREB leadership. And we're going to have a bit of a chat with Bill and talk a little bit about Richard's campaign. Now, there's been, um, we're down to two days before the uh, primary, and so there's a lot of things going on. And one of the things I wanted to talk about today, and one of the reason for this podcast, was there's a uh, you know there's a lot of concern about Richard. Richard has come into this uh, this uh, sphere kind of late in the game, you know, towards the end of uh, the convention season, and actually showed up and asked to speak at the convention. I was there, and I wanted to point out before we got started that I remember his talk at the convention. Although Tina won. Um, quite, um, you know, handily at the convention, Richard was well received by the activists there. And I think that had he campaigned longer, um, we might have had a different uh, outcome in that event. But uh, be that as it may, Richard now is vying for uh, the uh, primary to get uh, to be on the DFL ticket as the uh, uh, candidate for our side uh, come for the general election. And uh, he's up against uh, Tina Smith, who is the endorsed candidate on our side. And so um, what we see in, our, in, in a lot of uh, in our spaces is, is there's a lot of consternation um, about whether or not Richard is actually telling the truth. Because when you listen to him talk, and I, and I, and I have, and, and I found him to be quite compelling with the uh, issues, like the progressive issues that he has taken on. And, and he has actually, uh, to, you know, as far as I'm concerned, has been uh, talking about this for the better part of this entire election cycle and, and stood up the day after uh, Trump was elected. But what I wanted to do today is I wanted to take a look at the things that I've been hearing from some of my friends, some of my DFL friends, um, why they think Richard Painter is a bad decision. You know, I, I came out several days ago and I personally supported him on my uh, Facebook page and, and wrote a short uh, statement about that and immediately received some, some comments about it. And some in cases, someone actually called me a traitor for uh, backing Richard Painter in, the, in this election. And quite honestly, I, I, you know, and I'm getting a little personal, but we've tried to engage Tina Smith uh, with our group and we've actually got an invite out to her to uh, do this very same podcast as kind of a, you know, response podcast. We've not heard back from them in, in any of the times we've, we've reached out. Um, uh, so what we wanted to do today is to have, you know, give voice to the people in IREB who uh, actually think Richard is a bit of a phony. Maybe he's, uh, he's a wolf in sheep's clothing. And so I wanted to pose some of those hard questions to Bill. And, you know, before we get into it, Bill, maybe I'd give you a few minutes to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about Richard, and then uh, we can get started. Sounds great. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to be here. Um, you, you and I have had conversations throughout this process, and every time uh, you've reached out to, to ask a question or, or to ask if we're interested, and I know you tried to set up a debate and those kind of things, um, uh, we, we've always been uh, open to it. We'd love to get an opportunity to talk about the issues. Um, Richard is a candidate. Uh, not since Barack Obama have I been this excited to vote for someone. Uh, these are uh, very unique times, and he is a unique candidate. Um, I was attracted to his candidacy because of the honesty and the integrity and the work that he had been doing uh, when he put his name in the race, um, he and I had a conversation and uh, we share the same vision. And uh, I was very, very happy to get an opportunity to, to work and, and to help uh, spread his message as communications director for Richard's campaign. Um, knowing him firsthand, you know, going to events, seeing him daily, hearing him talk about the issues. This guy is as genuine as they come. Uh, his friend, Norman Eisen, who was Obama's chief ethics lawyer, uh, made a tweet today uh, saying pretty much that very same thing um, in regards to, to Richard and the type of person that he is. Uh, so I really hope that the people who are 
uh, weary of Richard who are, are saying that uh, he doesn't belong or he's, he's dishonest. Um, I, you know, I would challenge you to, to explain why you say he's dishonest or to, to, to challenge you uh, to come up with an, a policy position of his that you disagree with. Uh, well, that, this guy is made for this moment, and I'm very excited about his candidacy and to work for him. Well, that, <clears throat> so that, that actually uh, uh, jumps into one of my first questions. Has Richard ever actually been accused of uh, treachery or uh, illegal or illicit behavior of any sort at, at any point in his life? No, but to be honest with you, Mark, that's a good question in these days, in, in these times, uh, to get that off the table with politicians. But no, no, he's, he's, he's squeaky clean. Well, I, I didn't know the answer to that when I asked it, but I suspected I, uh, I knew. So, you know, that's what we want to get out of the table. And, and so um, let's talk about what he does for a living. So he works at the University of Minnesota as a law professor. Also, he is the vice chair of uh, Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. He has taken a leave from that position while running for office. He didn't think that it was appropriate for him to be a part of that. But Crew, along with Norman Eisen, again, Obama's ethics chief, they were the ones who brought up the emoluments uh, violations with the Trump administration. They brought this up before his inauguration. They said he had to put his business into a blind trust or it was going to cause conflicts of interest that this country had never been exposed to before. Presidents, all presidents have, have done that. You know, obviously, not to this level that Trump would have had to do, and it would have been very complicated for him to do it, no question, but for the American people to have faith that Donald Trump is making legislation based on what's good for the country and not what's good for his bottom line, he had to divest these interests. And so when he did not, uh, uh, Richard and Norman Eisen with crew, they sued uh, the, the president for the emoluments violation. The judge ruled they didn't have standing, which just meant private citizens couldn't sue the president. But um, in Maryland, a suit based on their initial suit is going forward. So there is a victory in that emoluments clause in terms of holding the Trump administration accountable for these just rampant financial conflicts of interest. Um, uh, so law professor is the short, short answer to that. The long answer is he's got some side jobs. He's trying to get money out of politics. And uh, he speaks often at, at uh, uh, ACLU events at uh, American Promise events, which is uh, trying to overturn Citizens United. Uh, he's kind of one of the go-to guys for getting money out of politics and talking about corruption. Yeah, so that's kind of it. Gets back to one of the things that uh, you know he, he uh, they were there was some you know discussion initially that came out. So he worked for President Bush, and and you know honestly, mm -hmm. most of the folks in the progressive community don't like President Bush one bit. And, uh, yeah. you know, so and yep. there were some, you know, very controversial appointments, that type of thing, um, you know, without taking a lot of time, because I think Richard's done a good job of explaining that. Could you, mm -hmm. you know, touch that, uh, touch on that again, you know, for the listener? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, from 2005 to 2007, he was a chief ethics lawyer. It, it, essentially, what that is, is a conflicts of interest lawyer, the financial conflicts of interest lawyer. So if there was a an appointment like Hank Paulson, who was, I think, Treasury Secretary, Richard had to look at his portfolio and, and, and just pretty much his candidacy in general and say, okay, here are your conflicts. So he said, you have to sell $600 million worth of the Goldman Sachs stock before you can take this job and be, you know, an advocate for the country. Um, you know, boo hoo. You had to sell $600 million of the stock. Um, the same thing with Supreme court justices, they would send to him, you know, here's who we're looking at, make sure there's no conflicts of interest there that would pop up in a Senate confirmation hearing and, you know, uh, you know, make us look bad, essentially. So he would look at these, these nominees, say, oh, yes, they pass the, the, the test when it comes to financial conflicts of interest. Um, and that was his role. He, you know, he had no role at all with Cheney. He worked for Bush um, in, in vetting those nominees. Okay. Yeah. So there, you know, there's, there was talk about, like, you know, did he have anything to do with the Supreme Court nomination? And um, my understanding, to, you know, make a, give it a short answer is that, Yes, the shortlist was given to him to take a look at to see which ones had conflicts that needed to be resolved so that they wouldn't come back and cause embarrassment after the fact. And as Correct. So he had no role. In, exactly. He, he had no role in selecting the justices. So he wrote an article in the, in the New York Times when he, where he was calling for Republicans to give Merrick Garland a hearing. And in that, some people have taken his words out of context to make it look like he was he had a role in. Uh, you know, selecting these justices is which a uh, chief ethics lawyer does not have a role in selecting justices. Their role is to vet them for financial conflicts of interest. But he was there. So this is kind of another interesting story. He was there during some uh, interesting goings on in the White House. Mm -hmm. 
and was privy to some information and, and how things went. And, you know, that's the, where the idea that Mayor Cardland might have been selected had we had more of a Democratic majority. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump around. I'm trying to I'm going to be a little, you know, antagonistic. Well, not antagonistic, but I want to be the devil's advocate here. So, so Bill, you know, <laughs> Absolutely. You, you're you're a great supporter of Richard. I've I've been talking to you, and I've been talking. I don't know how many months now since I first met you. I, I you know, Richard's mm -hmm. been in you know the resistance sphere since the beginning. Um, how mm -hmm. did you come to meet Richard? It, you know, I had followed him, like I said, on on Twitter. I'd, I'd followed his career on uh, watching his appearances on on you know MSNBC and CNN. And just, it was a man of integrity. And so when he decided to run or he was, he actually, he actually went through a, um, an exploratory phase where it wasn't just to raise gobs of money. He actually went through an exploratory phase to decide if this is what was right to do. And mm -hmm. during that period, I reached out to him. We had a conversation and I, and I joined the campaign and I, and I've it's been one of the greatest experiences in my life. What, so what is your background in politics? I, I'm a little bit of a newbie. I mean, I, been political most of my life, but I'm a little bit newbie, you know, in, in direct party politics at this point. Where do you come from? Yeah, my, my background is in television. So I was um, covering um, political events as uh, politicians. And to be honest with you, I was, I was disgusted with where our politics had gotten and maybe even where they started. And um, for me, a refreshing candidate like this is something that you just don't get an opportunity to vote for very often. And so it is an absolute no brainer for me. And, uh, yeah. Oh, so you're saying some that he, of the, I guess, go ahead. Well, I was going to ask, he stirs you, uh, you know, kind of on a West Wing kind of level, right? Oh, Is that what you're trying okay, to say? Okay, so let me, let me just give you a couple stories. Let me give you a couple stories. So when I was, you know, I would interview politicians and they would have their prepared remarks. And no matter what I asked, they were going to get to these prepared remarks. And of course, it was my job to challenge them and to make sure you're getting substance and all those kind of things. And good reporters are able to do that. But the double speak, the you know, just hiding behind a public relations team and, you know, kind of putting your finger in the air and testing the water, the winds to, to determine how you're going to answer a question and, and relying on polls and those kind of things. And Richard doesn't do any of that. Um, you want to know how he, how he feels on an issue, ask him, he'll tell you, and he won't pander. Uh, one example is he was, um, you know, he's a strong advocate for keeping gray wolves on the endangered species list. And he said that at everywhere he's gone. And, he was asked that at, at, at uh, Farm Fest. Farm Fest, yeah. Um, you know, a lot of the farmers are, are dealing with, um, you know, some issues with them. And, and, he, and he, in that arena where all the other candidates talked around the issue and gave double speak and talked for a minute about nothing, he answered the question and said, we got to keep on the endangered species list. And he mentioned how wolves don't have pack money. So they, uh, you know, and they don't vote. So, you know, people don't take them uh, as seriously as they should, but well, speak, uh, it's, it's an speak, important issue for him. Well, speaking of Wolves, and I watched that, actually, I watched that today, um, and it was awesome. I mean, you know, and I saw that. He was the one that stood up and just said what he thought, and, and it was what most Minnesotans, I think, would say. Um, but but mm -hmm. now we're talking about Wolves, and uh, so let's uh, pivot to Wolves in sheep's clothing. People think Richard mm -hmm. is a wolf in sheep's clothing, that we're going to uh, we're going to find out that after we elect him, he's going to convert right away. He's going to become a Republican or he's going to, you know, um, you know, uh, start caucusing with the Republicans, um, that this was some sort of secret plan by the white house, by Trump and, and his supporters to regain control of the Senate, this whole thing, right from the start, getting rid of, uh, uh, um, uh you know, our previous yeah. Senator and, and, and the, yeah. the whole thing. So, uh, that's a big I assure you that is not the case. Um, I assure you that is not the case. Of course, this is a two-year term to finish off Al Franken's two years is left on his term. Richard um, will caucus with the Democrats. He has uh, agreed with the Democrats on every single issue over the last few years in terms of the issues where it was a divide between Democrats and Republicans. Richard, is, you know, he started the, the fight for legalizing gay marriage back in 2011 before most Democrats went public with their fight for it. Um, he's been fighting to get money out of politics. He's been fighting against these Republican tax bills that give these big tax cuts to the rich. You know, he spoke out against Reagan for doing that back in the 80s. Didn't make sense uh, fiscally. It didn't make sense because he knew it was going to lead to cuts in social services. Um, his policies are what they are, and he's laid them out very clearly. And these are, you know, if you look back 10, 15 years ago, these are the exact same things that he believed in. The one exception is, is on health care. He admits that, uh, you know, 10, 12 years ago, he, he would have supported something like 
Obamacare, Affordable Care Act. That's probably what he would have said was the best alternative to our health care crisis. But over the last few years in talking to small business owners and kind of seeing where Bernie Sanders went with the Medicare for All, um, he is a strong, strong advocate for Medicare for All. He, he believes the single payer system is necessary for getting these prices down. And, you know, a report came out the other day, and there's, there's plenty of reports on both sides, but a single payer system, you know, in the long run, likely will save us money. And certainly for the lower income people, it almost certainly will, will save them money uh, and we'll be getting the better care and everyone will be insured and, and those kind of things. So that, you know, that's one issue where he certainly has evolved over the last couple of years. Well, yeah, and I, I want to actually get on the single pair uh, stuff a little bit too. You know, the thing is, is in America, we spend $10,000 per person per year for our health care and we get worse results than everyone else in the world. Um, the next most expensive place to get health care is Japan, where you get six, where they spend $6,000 per year. And there's places in the world that spend less than half and maybe even a quarter and get excellent single payer health care. So to say that we don't have room to save money and provide better health care than what we're getting right now is just, it's just, uh, it's, it's uh, propaganda from the health care industry. And, you know, one of the things, one of the reasons. Mark, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and, and when, you know, how frustrated do we have to get? You know, when do we finally start voting and saying, okay, these candidates who are in the back pocket of the medical device industry or the drug industry or whatever it may be, the healthcare industry, are not going to give us the best health care that we need. They're not going to advance single payer health care. It's not in their interest. And so, you know, Richard is not taking PAC money. He is not, he is not getting any donations. I can guarantee you from, you know, the CEO of Medtronic or these big, uh, 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 health insurance companies. Yeah, so that's actually, you know, and, and so that that's why I wanted to, you know, have this discussion because, you know, from what I'm seeing out of Richard and the things that he's saying, is, you know, this is the kind of guy that those of us that got really excited about Bernie Sanders and, you know, progressive ideas in the 2016 cycle, you know, Richard seems to be really resonating with us. And so, you know, that's where the criticism is coming. Is he just being an opportunist here? Is he, you know, conveniently changing parties just because he sees an opportunity and, and he's jumping into it? Or is this something that he really feels? I mean, I'm getting the sense, Bill, that, you know, you, you're a true believer. I, I am for certain. I, I, I believe in these things. I believe in single payer. I believe in a, in a better country for all of us. And, and, you know, there's so many opportunities for us to improve on what we're doing. Um, you know, is Richard really that guy? That's what I want to know. Is he that guy? Is yeah. he, no, is it, he really uh, thanks for asking the question. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll tell you this. Number one, if you want to know where he stands on the issues, ask him. Recently, we've put up on Facebook and Twitter uh, all of his responses from the debate in Duluth uh, that, that he had. And unfortunately, Senator Smith wasn't able to attend that or didn't attend that, I should say. But uh, um, so there's, there's, a, there's where he stands on 11 different issues. Look it up. Um, on his website, there's a lot of stances on issues. Uh, we've been posting things on YouTube and on the website for a long time. So, so we're not hiding any of his viewpoints. If you okay. ask the people who know him best, if you ask the people who know him best, they not only describe him as a, you know, a great legal mind and, you know, a, a fierce advocate and a guy with tenacity, they describe him as a very honorable and genuine man. We, I was able to, to, to Myron Orfeld, Orfield, who is a law pro professor at the University of Minnesota, used to be a state legislator, a DFL legislator, lifelong Democrat. And then Arnie Carlson, the former governor of the state, had them in the room together. And they both said the same thing. Richard Painter is a truly unique person a wonderful wonderful person this isn't the guy who would who would go on some covert opera operation for essentially you know seven or eight years just so he could flip a seat for some you know some reason I, that, 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 you know I, and i appreciate the people's concerns about that they, this is a big election to get a democrat in there I, I can guarantee you the strongest voice for the dfl party in the united states senate is richard painter I'm hoping that's the case. I, I, I really am. Um, actually, so I was going to, I have uh, his wiki page come up, but I, I don't know that I want to read through that, but uh, he does have one. So I, I hope folks uh, um, uh, go spend time to look up. He uh, is a graduate of both Harvard and Yale. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, he's, uh, uh, ethics seems to be a theme with this guy, that he seems to you know, be the type of person you could count on to tell the truth, that he says what he believes um, he's he's also a man of faith. Is that uh, I, I picked up on that during the farm? 
Yeah, that- yeah, and he occasionally speaks about his faith. Yeah, he Episcopal uh, religion, you know, which is one of the few faiths that is a pro-choice religion. Um, and you know, he occasionally speaks about that on the campaign trail. Okay, why well, I don't want to get into oh uh, the one question I did want to post is so. Here we are. We're in this heated uh, um, uh, primary. We've got two couple of days, uh, you know, until everyone they can do early voting tomorrow on Monday, and then on Tuesday, you know, da, 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 you know, we have to get it all done. And uh, so Ken Martin um, said some things to, about Richard that are going to be uh, difficult to live with if Richard wins the election. Do you want to make any comments about that, Phil? Well, the the, the frustrating thing about it is. They were dishonest. You know, so the first thing that Ken Martin came out with is a Facebook post that was a side-by-side graphic of Richard and Tina Smith. Richard's side was filled with inaccuracies and outright falsehoods. So once people started pointing out those falsehoods, he took the post down on Facebook. Didn't correct it, though. From there, um, then it started with press releases that were exaggerate or, or, or just misrepresenting his role in things. It was all in this effort to try to, re- to, to paint him as a, you know, a right wing crazy person, essentially somebody who's like you said, a wolf in sheep's clothing mm-hmm. um, in, in emails to DFL voters. In, uh, and then on Twitter, you know, he's trying to make this case that Richard isn't a strong supporter of unions, which is totally false. And he tried to make a claim that Richard wasn't using union uh, to make his campaign materials, which is totally false. It is one thing to advocate for a candidate based on facts and reality. Um, it is very, very disturbing for me, it, it, who, who you know is a, a, a DFLer, for the so, head of the DFL in a DFL primary. In a DFL primary, it's one thing if we're talking about a DFLer going up against a Republican. A DFL primary to go after a candidate like he has in a dishonest way. It has been very disturbing, but. Um, I, I see no problem in uh, in advancing. Um, once Richard wins the, the primary on Tuesday, um, it'll be a it'll be a it will be a fine situation, and we'll move forward. And and, and Richard will 100 percent, and this is a Joe Namath guarantee, will beat Karn Housley in the general. Okay, I've I've been taking up all the time. We're getting down towards the end of the uh, the show here. So um, Cheryl, you wanted to ask, ask a question. Yeah. I'm gonna we had Cheryl and Sarah yeah. sitting in, and I want to give them both a question here real quick. Okay, well, what I want to do is just um, encourage folks, I think that this has been said, but I want to say it directly, encourage folks to go out to the campaign site on Facebook for both Richard Painter and for Tina Smith, because as I look at those sites, the one that has substances um, is Richard Painter's, and I am very impressed. Um, I think the campaign has done an absolutely outstanding job and the positions are out there on that page um and he has worked extraordinarily hard to get his message out on very little money and i look at that and contrast it with tina smith's page and i see a lot of fluff and i see that she hasn't really engaged the electorate and i you know i don't want to be terribly negative but i think people should go out on her page to see what's out there and make that comparison for themselves and if they do that i think that they'll come to the conclusion that richard painter is truly the better of the two candidates and who should represent us in minnesota the other thing is i see richard painter as a heavy hitter and I do not like the idea of hiring, or, and that's what we're essentially doing with our votes, um, hiring a senator that is known to be quiet. Um, she has basically gone on a listening campaign um, around Minnesota during this campaign, and we don't need people anymore that just listen. Uh, I think Richard Painter has listened. He has formed his opinions. He's going to hit the ground running, and he is going to um, be a really effective senator for us. So that's what I want to uh, urge is that, you know, people quit thinking about, is he a Republican or was he a Republican or what's he going to do once he's in there? Listen to the man and understand what he has to offer. And if we do that and we vote with um, our eye on what the issues are, uh, we're going to get the best person that we can ever have, and he's going to be a leader, 
in Congress, mm -hmm. just like Elizabeth Warren is, and some of the others, the outspoken ones. Um, and so, you know, do we want a senator that's going to, you know, sit back and, and vote with the others, or do we want somebody that's going to lead the narrative? And my vote is for Richard Painter. So that's about what I have to say. Okay, awesome, Cheryl. Thanks for that. that. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sarah, do you got anything you want to ask Bill? Well, yeah. Um, you know, I've been talking about the week. Oh, Sarah's up at the um, cabin. I think we're, we're having some audio problems with her. Hey, can you get, can you hear me now? Yeah, give it a shot. Yep. Okay. Um, so in the, in talking to various people about the different candidates and what I know about them, um, a couple of different questions have come up about Richard. One is, um, what, what is his take on the Kavanaugh, um, mm -hmm. you know, for, for, uh, so this, the Supreme Court yeah. and once he's in office, will he support the appointment of these conservative judges or will he oppose that? Yeah, so the way Richard has talked about the Supreme Court is, number one, he says there should be no confirmation hearing until uh, the president and, you know, and probably the vice president and members of the Trump administration have their hearing first. It is absolutely completely inappropriate for a president to be nominating a judge who potentially will be the judge in, in a case of his. Um, and he's already gotten one through. The other thing is Richard has talked about in these confirmation hearings, he needs answers. You know, these judges have gotten good at playing, you know, these political games and they avoid these questions. What do you think about Roy, Roy v. Wade? Well, I don't want to talk about, a, you know, an existing case, you know, 45 years ago. Uh, what do you think about Citizens United? He, so he needs people to answer those questions. If he doesn't get a judge who answers, you know, I think we should keep Roe v. Wade. I think we should overturn Citizens United. Um, it would be a no vote for him. Those things would be, um, it would be impossible for him to get past that. Um, so more than likely, a Trump nominee would it probably, it would, you know, it'd be almost impossible for me to envision a scenario where you would get a yes vote from Richard from a Trump nominee. Thank you. Awesome. All right. So You're I welcome. think we've kind of gotten to the end of what we wanted to do. We wanted to keep it to around 30 minutes so people can listen to it in uh, a short order. So I, I appreciate it. And I, I just wanted to kind of go around the room and say thanks to everybody. Cheryl Casey from our, uh, Cheryl Casey and Sarah Chapman, both from our leadership team. I'm Mark Frasconi. Um, we're all from the uh, Indivisible Resistance of Egan and Burnsville. Look us up on Facebook. And with us tonight was uh, Bill Halter from, uh, he's uh, Richard Painter's Communication Director. Is that right, Bill? Do Correct. you have any other titles? Correct. Well, in this campaign, I've been doing a little bit of everything. So you could throw a slash uh, volunteer coordinator slash, um, you know, get out the votes. You guy, you can slash everything else. But uh, it's been a lot of fun. There's just a, uh, uh, we got to go strong for two more days and then uh, maybe take a couple days off and then start working for the general. So uh, people want to get a hold of you, want to help you out. What's the best way to do that? Uh, go to painterminnesota.com. There's a volunteer site, uh, painterminnesota.com. As Cheryl mentioned, the Facebook page, Richard Painter Facebook. And then there's two Twitter pages, RWP Minnesota and RWP USA. Um, RWP USA is Richard's individual Twitter page. It has over uh, half a million followers. So um, that, that's, that's more likely to be Richard's voice. Um, sometimes on the Painter Minnesota page or the Painter Facebook page, it is from Richard's voice, but uh, his Twitter page is always from him. So sometimes we're taking care of some of the posting on Facebook. So. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you, uh, everyone, for showing up. And uh, we're going to get this posted right away so people can listen to it. Uh, good luck, uh, Bill. And, and I look forward to seeing you guys in the next three months. All right. Mark, Cheryl, uh, Sarah, thanks so much. Talk to you guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right.